Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Um, yes, we are a webinar. You can call us that. We won't be too offended by it. We <laughs> too embrace, <laughs> yeah, embrace the webinar. Yes, of us. <laughs> um, the webinar that we um, do every Wednesday morning at um, normally uh, this week, of course, because yesterday was on um, the New Year's Day holiday. Um, we as a state agency were closed, as I'm sure most, many places were, most of you probably. So we're doing it this week on a special day on Thursday. We did the same thing last week, same thing, Christmas is on Wednesday, so we did it on Thursday. Next week we're back to Wednesdays, so don't get used to this. <laughs> <laughs> um, normally we do it every Wednesday morning. It's always at 10 a.m. Central Time, as it still is today. Um, runs for about an hour long, depending on uh, chat and questions and whatnot. And we do um, a mixture of things here, presentations, mini training sessions, book reviews. Basically, as it's library related, we want to have it on the show to share with everyone. Um, and the sessions are recorded, so if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays or Thursdays, <laughs> um, as the case may be, you can always go to our website and see the recordings of all of our shows going back to the very beginning, which was in uh, January 2009. Oh, actually, yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> So we do bring in guest speakers on the show, and sometimes um, we have um, library, Nebraska Library Commission staff, and that's what we have this morning. Um, next to me is Emily Nimsikan, who is the cataloging librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission, and she's going to join us or tell us about uh, BibFrame, which I know zero about. <laughs> I have not ever heard about it until she. I'm not a cataloger. I don't do that. <laughs> um, I had not even heard about it until she said, I want to come on the show and do a session about this. Cause, right. But then I see it, something coming up. I know all about Mark. Mark, that's, that's <laughs> Mark, ACR2. I got that down. Um, so um, I'll just hand it over to you, Emily. You can take it away um, with your presentation. Here. Great. Thanks, Krista. And thanks to all of you for joining us on the day after a holiday here. Yeah, we so, all made it. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. It feels like Wednesday. I don't know. I'm going to be all confused the rest of the week. Um, but yeah, thank you for joining me. We've got I, yeah, like Krista said, probably a lot of non-catalogers have never even heard of BibFrame, and I know it's really new on the radar for a lot of people, even if you are a catalogger, so I thought it would be good to get some information out there. Um, I don't consider myself an expert on it either because it's so brand new, and it, I mean, obviously it's not even implemented yet. We're all still cataloging with Mark. Mm -hmm. So um, all of you out there, I definitely welcome questions as we go along and comments if you have anything to offer that, that you know, I didn't cover or... You have something to say, well, I think, you know, this can add in. Please, please jump in with comments, too. Anything to contribute? Oops. going? Click on it. There we go. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so let's start with the very basics. Like I said, this is going to be a very basic overview of BibFrame and what it means for the cataloging world and the library world. Um, so what is BibFrame? Well, um, it is not exactly an acronym, more of an abbreviation um, for the Bibliographic Framework. That's where BibFrame comes from. Um, and probably the most shorthand way to think of it is that it is going to be a replacement for MARC um, machine readable cataloging as an exchange format for bibliographic data in library catalogs and beyond, I guess. Um, part of it is I think that it's intended to be a computer uh, way of formatting our records or our data so that they can be used by people who are not librarians. Um, MARC is very, very specific to libraries, um, and so we want to kind of make our information work with other information out there on the web. Um, here is sort of a more official definition, I guess. It comes from the Library of Congress itself. I did not mention before, but this is an initiative from the Library of Congress. Um, and they began by calling it the Bibliographic Framework Initiative, so that's where the whole BibFrame name comes from. And it is designed to, as they say, better accommodate future needs of the library community. Uh, Mark has kind of has us stuck in the past, and they want to move forward into um, web-based linked data standards. I've highlighted the important things there. We're moving away from Mark and moving towards linked data standards, and I will talk a little bit more later about what the heck linked data means. So, you know, I've said this is kind of intended to be a replacement for MARC. I mean, that's one way of thinking of it. They also kind of think of it as a whole data model and, you know, vocabulary for dealing with uh, bibliographic data. So, but people are all kind of hyped up about it being a replacement for MARC, you know. And I have to say that, you know, I didn't necessarily expect 
within my career to see that Mark would finally <laughs> go by the wayside, but yeah. we've changed our thinking in a lot of ways. Um, for one thing, Mark is meant for printing catalog cards. It was originally designed not as an online catalog encoding it's standard. Pre-online, yes, yeah. it was designed in the nineteen sixties for printing catalog cards. The Library of Congress, you know, that was copy cataloging back in the day. You would order cards from the Library of Congress. So even though our online catalog, the computerized catalogs function very differently from a card catalog, our system is still set up for card catalogs in a lot of ways. So that's clearly behind the times. As I mentioned before, it's only used by libraries, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it really does kind of limit some of the things that can be done with our bibliographic data and some of the ways in which we can import data from other sources into our catalogs. Um, librarians were kind of ahead of the time when Mark came out, this, you know, cool programming was, you know, a really nice, efficient way to print catalog cards. And But then, since then, computer science has kind of moved on, and they have developed easier-to-use standards, and more importantly, just standards that everybody on the web uses, not just librarians. Um, another thing that could be seen as a flaw of MARC is that it's not very specific. Um, the MARC fields and subfields, you know, there's a lot of them, and it seems like, you know, they might, you know, break down to every possible piece of information you could want to include in a catalog record, but really you'll find out that a lot of things are used for multiple types of information. Um, you know, the computer has no way of understanding exactly what is in a particular MARC field or a particular MARC subfield. Um, for example, the 245 field, the subfield B, the other title information. Um, as you'll see in this example, in the 245 field, it is a subtitle. However, it can also be used for a parallel title, the translation of a title into a different language, as in this example. And the way we know the difference looking at it as humans is by the punctuation that precedes the subfield B. So the distinguishing information is not even contained within that subfield. So computers have a really, really hard time dealing with that. If you were, for example, wanting to look for only parallel titles, it would be a hard, have a hard time pulling that out. And then it gets even more complicated because, you know, certain subfields can't be repeated, and so when you have both a subtitle and a parallel title, it all gets lumped together into one subfield B. So it makes sense when you look at it as a user, but a computer, not so much. Um, I chose that example because it um, was brought to my attention by a really good article in the Code for Lib journal, which is freely available online, and I've got the URL there, and I don't remember if Krista mentioned this, but all the links will be available to you when we send out the email about the recording, so yes, you don't yeah, have to scramble to write things down here. Yeah, afterwards, <laughs> you'll have links to everything, yeah. But I, you know, recommend this one, you know, some of the Code for Lib stuff is, you know, way over my head, really technical computer stuff, but this one I think is a really, really good article as far as explaining some of the problems with Mark or why computer scientists kind of freak out when they see Mark and they go, wait, what? I don't understand this. So, so what do people do? Yeah, so <laughs> it's just, it's different than what a lot of computer, modern computer programming languages do. And so he, Jason Tomal, who wrote this article, he goes through pretty specific examples of how he was trying to pull out specific pieces of information from records for, I think, musical scores he was looking at and, you know, things like that, like the fact that subfield B in the 245 field was used for a lot of different things really kind of messed up what he was trying to do. And so I, I found it to be a really interesting read and it kind of highlights maybe the need for BibFrame and, you know, thinking beyond Mark. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of gets at what the next point about why Mark is kind of not suiting our needs anymore is our thinking has kind of switched that we need data instead of records. Um, and that, you know, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more when we talk about linked data and the fact that BibFrame is a linked data model, but um, the general way of thinking about things in the computer science world now, in the web programming world, is to think about really small, discrete pieces of information rather than a whole catalog record um, that just re represents one book in a library collection. You know, we want to break down pieces so we can bring out the fact that each author is an individual piece of data, uh, and so you can find other things by that author and information about that author. You know, you can link to sources outside the library, perhaps. Um, 
other things about the subject heading. So everything is just kind of creating this whole web of data, so to speak. And Mark doesn't really lend itself to that pretty well. Um, if you look at one Mark field, you're not really going to understand a whole lot or be able to find things about that field without seeing the record as a whole. All right, so that's the basic of what BibFrame is and why it has come to be, why we're moving away from Mark. And now I just want to cover a brief timeline. I don't know, it's kind of funny to call it a history of BibFrame because it hasn't really been around that long. It's more current events than history, I guess. Um, but I will cover the timeline here. May of 2011 was when this bibliographic framework initiative was announced by the Library of Congress. Um, that was pretty much towards the end of the national test that was going on for the RDA resource description and access new cataloging uh, code. And, you know, one of the things that came out of that test was that they really felt that we needed to be working on a replacement for MARC in order for RDA to be really effective. And so the Library of Congress announced their bibliographic framework initiative as a way of saying, hey, we are going to work on MARC, we're going to take, or getting rid of MARC, we're going to take this seriously. And then in October 2011, uh, more details were made available. And when they made that announcement in May, they didn't really say what was going to replace MARC. Um, in October of that year was when they published the bibliographic framework plan and officially announced that a linked data model was going to be used. Then about a year later, a little bit over a year later, they published what they called the BibFrame Primer, or the BibFrame Draft Model, which really got into some of the specifics of BibFrame, which we're going to cover here later. And I will also give you the link to that. It's available online as a PDF, and I'll cover that in resources later as well. Um, just a couple more developments that happened this past year in 2013. On the website, which I will be covering in pretty great detail, called BibFrame.org, was launched at the ALA Midwinter meeting. Um, as sort of the official place to go for information about BibFrame. So definitely keep that in mind as a pretty good all-around resource. And in August of 2013, so fairly recently, um, they updated what they call discussion papers on that website. It's on BibFrame.org. Um, these were produced by what they call the early experimenters, a number of organizations experimenting with BibFrame, and we're going to talk about those later too. And they kind of flesh out what a lot of the concepts of BibFrame we're talking about. So those are good resources to read as well, and they were fairly recently added, so they're pretty up to date. Do we have any questions yet at this point before um, we go? No. Jump into linked data? All right, cool. If you have any questions throughout, just go ahead and type them in. I'm monitoring everything here on the laptop, and I can throw them to Emily to handle. Yes, I, I, help you. I, <laughs> I certainly don't mind interruptions, so yes, please go ahead and type them in as they occur to you in case you might forget by the end of the presentation. But I do hope to have some extra time at the end, and we can run over a little bit if we need to. Oh, yes. Okay, so what the heck is linked data anyway? That's kind of a good basic foundation concept to have if you're going to be thinking about BibFrame. Um, and it sort of helps to understand the difference between MARC and between the BibFrame model. Um, here is what I generally use as my official definition of of linked data, and by official I mean I didn't just make it up, I got it from somewhere else, um, Wikipedia, you can go to sources any. And the highlights are that linked data is a method of publishing data on the web. Um, it builds upon technologies that we're pretty much used to, such as hypertext transfer protocol, the, the language for the web, um, and URIs. Um, but rather than using these to create content that humans can read, it, it sort of extends them, and so it makes the information kind of understandable by computers. The meaning of the information is encoded in a way that computers can read it and kind of get what the relationship between two different pieces of information are or recognize, hey, this piece of data and this piece of data are both talking about the same people and we can link them together. Um, to kind of illustrate that a little bit, right now this is sort of what the web looks like. We have all these resources out there. Um, you know, just web pages and web pages and more web pages, and they link to each other. You know, hyperlinks can um, link web pages together, but the links don't really tell us a whole lot about why these two things are related. Um, people can pretty much link web pages together for any old reason, um, and computers definitely don't know the reason behind these links. 
And so here's the difference with linked data. Um, two things. Number one, we're linking kind of more discrete pieces of data here rather than just to the monolithic web page. Um, so, and also the links have more specific relationships. So, you know, those little tiny pieces of data I have there um, on each individual web page, you know, they can be the same author or the same topic and these information from different sources are brought together through the linked data encoding. So basically speaking of encoding, here is the difference between standard HTML, hypertext markup language, which web pages are written in, and linked data encoding. Here's HTML and the tags, basically they don't tell the computer anything about how to understand the information. They basically tell the computer how to display the information. Uh, there's an H1 tag for a heading and a P tag for a paragraph and all it tells the computer is that hey this heading should be a little bit bigger and it should be in bold. <laughs> it doesn't tell you anything about what is included in that piece of information. Now here is an example of RDF resource description framework encoded in XML which is extensible markup language which is kind of similar to HTML in that it has tags but the tags instead of telling the computer how to display the information they tell the computer more about what that information is. Um, that top tag, the RDF description, that is basically an identifier for this resource we're talking about, which in this case happens to be a CD. And then all those other lines, they describe that CD. And as you can see right there in the tags, you know, that the computer is capable of knowing that one line is the artist, Bob Dylan, that one line is the country where the CD was produced, the United States, and so on and so forth. And so this is all encoded right in the, the programming, the, the encoding standard, rather than having to rely on human readers to understand the information. And the thing about linked data is that relationships are key. You really want to be able to um, lay out how different pieces of information are related to each other. And that's where um, the magic happens, so to speak, with linked data, um, both in terms of linking you know, as far as we're concerned, library resources to other resources on the web, or even, you know, on a smaller scale, people could do it as sort of a discovery layer for your catalog. You know, if you want to link resources from your catalog and your digitized archival items and, you know, your journals, you can bring them together by specifying relationships between those um, items. Right now we're used to connecting pieces of information based on their context. Um, when we look at a catalog record we can see title, or Christmas Carol, and author Charles Dickens. We know as human readers that that means that Charles Dickens wrote this book, but the computer doesn't know that. And if we just saw one of those pieces on their own, we wouldn't necessarily know that the record says anything about the other piece of information. With linked data, these relationships are more explicit. Um, RDF is based on what's called triples. They're um, also called, called statements. They're triples because they have three parts, subject, predicate, and object, like sentences. And so in this case, let's see, the subject and the object are entities that are related somehow, and then the predicate is the relationship. So in this case, a Christmas carol is the subject, has author is the predicate, the relationship, and then Charles Dickens is the object. And what this leads to is kind of what's called a data graph. Um, you know, we have the very simple triple there on the previous slide, but then you can see it expands into this whole web of data. You can um, talk about a particular person and that they were the author is one thing, but then it also can tell you, you know, what field they performed in, um, other things that they did. You know, I got this slide from an example at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. They did a presentation about their digital collections and they bring together items from a few different digital collections they have based on kind of a linked data model. And while we're talking about relationships, you know, the really cool part about linked data is, you know, not just to do it from one source of data, basically. You know, the example I told you before with the Bob Dylan CD, all that information came from the same place. But the really cool thing about linked data is that you can bring in um, terms and relationships from other places. So for example, again, I know this is pretty technical to look at and I promise I'm not going to make you look at too much more code <laughs> during the rest of this presentation. But up there at the top, 
on, let's see, the third line where you'll see the abbreviation DC and there's a URL after it. That indicates that we're bringing in Dublin Core Elements, which is a metadata scheme. And so, you know, the cool part of linked data is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. You can, you know, bring in terms that people have created somewhere else, relationships that people have specified somewhere else, and, you know, sort of repurpose that for your uses. Okay, so that was an overview of linked data, which is kind of just important to know because BibFrame is a linked data model. Now we're going to get into some of the technicalities of BibFrame itself, and here's where we're going to kind of explore the BibFrame.org website that I linked to earlier, and all this stuff is available there, so I highly recommend this as a jumping off place if you want to learn more about this. Um, on the BibFrame.org website, you'll see the basic model for BibFrame, and it has what is called core classes, and these are basically aspects of information in our bibliographic records, the bibliographic data we're working with. There are four of them, work, instance, authority, and annotation. And I realize this probably doesn't mean much <laughs> just looking at those words by themselves, but they have very specific definitions within BibFrame. So here's a little diagram that they have available on the website. Um, that will help explain things. Work and instance are basically, um, those classes refer to the stuff in our catalogs. Um, work is the abstract way of thinking about it, kind of the, the concept as it existed in the creator's head. Um, for example, you know, we were talking about Tale of Two Cities earlier, you know, the when Charles Dickens thought of it in his head, that's the abstract way, and it doesn't matter if it's in French or if it was the original English um, product publication of it, it's still the same work. And then the instance is the particular physical publication of it. So the French translation as published by a French publisher would be different than the English, um, the original English published by a different publisher. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later when we talk about how it relates to RDA, but some of you who are familiar with the Ferber model, the Functional Requirements for Bibliographic Records, big long name, mm -hmm. which is the basis for RDA, um, you know, work is a familiar term to you, for you guys. Um, Ferber has four classes of kind of what they call the Group 1 entities, work, expression, manifestation, and item, and they progress from this high-level abstract concept to an actual physical item sitting on your shelf. And I'll have a diagram that outlines this later, but for now, I guess I would say that work and manifestation are kind of combined into the bib frame work, or no, I'm sorry, work and expression, and then the bib frame instance is probably most comparable to a, a Ferber manifestation. And then the attributes that we would think of as being part of a Ferber item kind of come into play with the annotations that describe an instance. And again, hopefully I'll make much more sense in a few minutes. Um, a work as defined by the BibFrame website is a resource reflecting the conceptual essence of a cataloging resource. So like I said, that is the abstract existence in someone's mind. An instance is the resource reflecting an individual material embodiment of the work, so something that you can actually look at. Um, like I said, this relates to kind of the Ferber manifestation, which is a particular version, like a publication. You know, the Penguin Books edition of something would be different than the Random House edition, although I think Penguin and Random House are the same thing now. I don't know. Those publishers keep merging. Merging and buying each other. Exactly. Out, yeah. yeah, I don't know. But... Well, an instance, I think, in the bib frame sense is talking about all the copies of a particular, you know, it's not just one item that you hold in your hand. So it's concrete, but not exact to one item. And then authority, which is kind of, you know, getting away from what we think of as the Ferber model, maybe, um, is a resource reflecting key authority concepts that have defined relationships reflected in the work and instance. Again, I know this all sounds like jargon when you <laughs> quote it directly from the website, but authority, you know, if you're familiar with cataloging, you know that we have authority records in our catalogs now, and so that the authority concept in, or class, I should say, of entities in BibFrame still represents that basic thing. You know, authorities are, you know, the people who write the books, we want to have authorized headings for those, 
to use our older terminology. Um, we want to have a consistent way of doing subject headings. And I think I'm actually going to jump out to the website here really quick. Let's see. Here we go. Dibframe.org. Um, this is where I'm going to start showing you where some of these resources appear on this website. Um, under vocabulary is where you'll see the things that I'm talking about now. There's that lovely diagram that we um, looked at before. And if you click on all these, you can find out more information about work, instance, authority, and annotation. Um, right now I wanted to show you authority. Um, and authority is the one class that has um, more specific types. There's agents, which is like a person or an organization, somebody who created a resource, a place, a controlled term for a geographic area, um, a temporal concept, which is basically a chronological period, and then a topic. So that those are like subject headings, or topical subject headings, I should say. I'm going to get back to where I was <laughs> There we go. And then the last core class on the BibFrame model is annotation. And the technical definition is a resource that asserts additional information about other BibFrame resources. Um, basically, this can be thought of as, um, I would say, attributes of a work or an instance. Let me actually go back to that diagram there. Um, for example, for an instance, the publisher is a an annotation, or the published app. Those are annotations that can um, describe the instance. Whereas, I guess the authorities they more describe the work. You know, the abstract model always has the same creator or the same subject based on, you know, it doesn't matter which publication of it it is. So authorities kind of describe the work and annotations describe the instance, basically. So that was, you know, the five minute, I don't know how long, <laughs> basic introduction to BibFrame. Obviously there is much, much more to uncover at that BibFrame.org website. Um, we're going to jump back there in a little bit and go over some of the resources they have available. But I wanted to talk for a little bit about how BibFrame is related to RDA, the Resource Description and Access Cataloging Code that um, officially was implemented by the Library of Congress in March of last year now, 2013. I'm not used to it being 2014 yet. <laughs> well, yeah, you <laughs> <laughs> I've been saying it's been implemented this year, but no, it's last year now. Um, Obviously, as I said, these are kind of tied together because it was kind of one of the conditions for the implementation of RDA was that we do some kind of substantial work towards replacing MARC because in a lot of ways, a lot of the things that are contained in the RDA rules really can't be fully realized in MARC. Um, MARC doesn't allow for the kind of relationships, you know, as I said, with linked data, relationships are key and MARC really doesn't allow for linking to various things the way we'd like to and the way that RDA makes possible. So BibFrame and MARC are kind of linked together that way. Um, here's a quote from the Library of Congress BibFrame website that says, RDA is an important source of elements in the vocabulary for BibFrame, even though it generally aims to be independent of any particular set of cataloging rules. So that's interesting to me. I mean, BibFrame was kind of put out there as a major stipulation that, you know, in order to implement RDA, we need to have something new. But it kind of aims to go beyond RDA. And like I said, one of the aims is to sort of say our library data can play nice with other data out there. So obviously you don't want to say that, you know, in order to use BibFrame encoding, you have to be using RDA. So, you know, as I pointed out before, there are some differences between RDA. You know, we're used to thinking, well, those of us who have, you know, spent time wrapping our heads around RDA and Ferber are used to work expression manifestation and item and now wait what we have to do works and in instances wait what uh, so there are some differences in a way I would say that it kind of let's see is an abstraction of the R RDA model um, it, it's less specific I suppose and like I said before I think work and expression are wrapped into the big frame work and manifestation and item are kind of represented by the big frame instance so I think the point is to kind of 
dumb it down isn't quite the right word, but simplify it, I suppose, <laughs> um, yes, yes. so that we can use our data with other data from that are not from libraries. You know, um, for those of you who are kind of familiar with various... So we can play well with others. Right, and then I think better. the point is that people can kind of set up community profiles to kind of be more specific on their own terms, but still be able to translate, yeah, and play well with others. Um, for those of you who are familiar with metadata standards, um, Dublin Core, if you're familiar with that, was kind of designed to be a very bare bones, basic, you know, very you might simplified. have richer data in your mark records or whatever, but if you do a crosswalk to Dublin Core, then it can be simplified and other people can use it and they might transform it into, I don't know, mods or something else, but Dublin Core is kind of the universal language, <laughs> maybe not the only universal language, but it's a simplified language that can then be transformed to other things. And I kind of think that's the deal with BibFrame. It's trying to simplify library data so that it can mesh with other data out there. So it's not as specific as RDA. It fits well with RDA, but it's not exactly the same thing. Um, and the credit for this image goes to a publication that was um, published by NISO called the Information Standards Quarterly. Um, and that's freely available in a PDF online, and I've got that linked in the resources at the end, too. Um, I kind of feel like the whole bib frame and RDA thing is the case of which came first, the chicken or the egg, <laughs> or which needs to come first, I guess, is the, the question. You know, some people, RDA has been widely debated on cataloging list serves as to whether it was a good idea or not, and yes. worth the expense and everything. And one thing that a lot of people have brought up is, is it worth changing the rules when we don't have a new encoding standard yet? As I said, RDA is not fully really realized in MARC, and so I guess we're kind of doing the chicken and the egg at the same time here now. <laughs> um, RDA is obviously implemented and rolling and everything, so I mean, we decided, hey, we're going to do that first, but they're very, very interlinked, I would say. And in a way, I think BibFrame is going to be what really makes RDA work. Um, there's another pretty interesting article that came out recently, very recently, within the past month or so, I would say, um, at the online library journal called In the Library with the Lead Pipe. Um, and there's a link there that, again, this is freely available online. Where he, uh, Jason W. Dean talks about BibFrame and says, he refers to RDA by saying that the change in rules for metadata creation represented by RDA will also help library metadata to be more useful. This is after he's already talked about how BibFrame will help. But in his opinion, he says, so perhaps to a lesser extent than BibFrame. So a lot of people think that BibFrame is an even more important revolution in cataloging and library data than RDA was. And RDA definitely made a big wave. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> this, you know, even bigger things may be coming as we move away from Mark. So, you know, if you think that this is all pretty abstract and, you know, conceptual data models and all that, you, you would be right. It's, it's definitely very abstract right now. It's, it's in the beginning stages. I think it will still be a while before, mm -hmm. you know, we are fully working with BibFrame. But I did want to kind of give you some ways to kind of see this more practically. Um, and there are some resources at BibFrame.org that can help you do that. They have what they call use cases, demonstrations, and tools. And I'll jump back out to their website to talk about some of these. Um, and I have the URLs for all of these various tools here, but you can also find them from the main bibframe.org homepage. So, let's see. So under documentation, you'll see the use cases. Let's see here. And use cases are kind of um, hypothetical situations for how people might interact with a BibFrame catalog, so to speak, or or what a a shared cooperative cataloging environment will look like when everybody's using BibFrame. And so I think this is kind of cool. A lot of it is still showing you kind of the really technical code behind it, so I found it a little bit overwhelming, but I like the idea of kind of just showing these um, examples of how you might use it and how it might be different conceptually from what we're used to doing. And you'll see that each one has kind of this little case study hypothetical thing. For example, they tell you about cataloging a new instance, so, you know, a new book that's not already cataloged. 
So it has this whole scenario where this middle school library is, you know, cataloging things for its uh, summer reading list. And so they've acquired some ebooks. And so they already have the physical copies, but they want to have a new record, so to speak, although we're kind of getting away from using the word record, um, for the ebook. And so it kind of goes through how they would search and what kind of response they might get in order to see that and how they could update the resource to add their holy information for the ebook rather than the physical book. So that's one particular um, use case. Um, I thought that one that was kind of interesting was this mobile reading one. Um, they could see BibFrame being useful to someone who is interested in reading Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, on, particularly on his tablet. He has a tablet mm. computer. And so walking into his local library, uh, the library's network notices that he has a tablet, and so they default to showing him only instances that he can read on his tablet. So nice. number one, it only shows him ebooks, and number two, it only shows him, you know, they know he doesn't have a Kindle, so they, they are going to show him something that is perhaps an EPUB format that will work on his tablet computer. And again, you know, there's the really technical code here for what a search request might look like, but I find those little scenarios at the beginning to be really useful for thinking about what we could do with BibFrame that maybe we can't currently do. I guess it has both of those. You know, this one, for example, I would say is something that we can't currently do, um, but things like cataloging a new instance or um, how you would do subject analysis or is, you know, kind of examples of, okay, there's stuff we're already familiar with and how would that work with BibFrame and it is any different from how we do it currently. So I would highly recommend glancing over these use cases. As you can see, there's quite a few, there's 15 of them. So it really helped me to get a more concrete idea of, okay, what, what's the difference? <laughs> so what, basically, you know, we're reading about BibFrame and all this stuff and we're going, okay, so what, what, what is it going to do? Then another resource is the demonstrations. And that's up here at the top under demos. And this is basically um, showing examples of how a catalog, the, the front end, the public facing version of a catalog might look with big frame records. And so they have a few different collections. These records come from different places, a lot of national libraries, some bigger university libraries. I'm going to look at the OCLC collection really quick. And if you want to, you'll see you can download these if you are have the capability to kind of manipulate the data and you want to play around yourself, but you can also look at these um, examples here as and these are kind of really rough, bare bones what a catalog might look like that was encoded with BibFrame. And some things don't look that different, but one thing I wanted to point out was this example of a nun such Christmas. Um, it has, you know, the main title for the actual, um, this is a sound recording, but then it also has the works that are contained. So it has, you know, a separate link for each selection. And these links don't actually go anywhere right now, which is one thing that I find frustrating about these demonstrations. Like, it doesn't fully perform the way you would actually see it in a it's catalog. A demo, but not. But not totally, totally yeah. <laughs> so, but I imagine that what would happen is that if you clicked on each of these links for the individual songs on this sound recording, you would get to a page for that, it's a different, you know, a work that's contained. And then you could also see other CDs that might have that song on it. I mean, when it comes to classical music, a lot of times works appear, you know, there's not just, it's not like a popular music album where it basically exists in one form, you know, this particular um, concerto could appear on, you know, a CD that has all of the composer's works and it could appear on a CD that has, you know, works for French horn or, you know, a particular type of instrument. So, I could see that being a really useful um, aspect of BibFrame if it allows for things like that in kind of a more granular, detailed way of navigating our catalog. So the demonstrations are something to keep in mind on the BibFrame.org website. And then the last thing they have is what's called tools. And this allows you to kind of play around with the data. They have the comparison service, which is where you enter the bibliographic identifier of a Library of Congress marked record. Um, this is not the Library of Congress control number. This is the individual, what appears as the 001 field in the Library of Congress record. Um, the best place to get that would be to go to the Library of Congress catalog website. Um, I 
actually, I will jump out there really quick. Oops. Post. And if you do a search, let's see. You know, if you just had anything in mind, you know, if you don't care what you're looking for, they say that, you know, if you were typing a number between 1 and 15 million, you should get something. <laughs> but, <laughs> But if you had something in mind that you were looking for, you can go to the Library of Congress catalog, do their search, look at the mark tags, and copy what's in the 001 field. So I will just do that. So this is the comparison service again, and you put your bib ID number in there and search. And this um, kind of the intermediate step between MARC and BibFrame, I believe, is MARC XML, where it's still the MARC record encoded in XML. Um, you can see that basically you still have the tag numbers, the subfield codes, and then when you click on this BibFrame RDF slash XML tab, you get different XML. Instead of having the tag numbers, it has you know, BibFrame topic, BibFrame authority, things like that. Um, one thing I wanted to show is that, you know, again, looking at all this back-end stuff, maybe it's kind of hard to see all the differences rather than looking at a front-facing public catalog, but um, BibFrame being, you know, sort of workable with RDA and everything, the intent is to be much more specific about encoding the information. So you'll notice that because the record has a copyright date instead of a publication date, um, whatever transfer service they're using here has been programmed to recognize that, and so the BibFrame element is copyright date. Um, let's see, I have another example that I was going to show you that has a publication date instead. This is for the book called Cataloging Correctly for Kids. Obviously, I just grabbed books that were in my office. <laughs> They're all about cataloging. And in this case, let's see, let me scroll down to the publication information. Um, because it didn't have a C in front of it, they recognized that that was a publication date, and in BibFrame, it's called a provider date, apparently. So, hmm. you know, it is, yeah, yeah. so they, they're both more specific rather than, you know, just having a 260 field subfield C, which could be either a copyright date or a publication date. Um, it's a more specific form of encoding. So if you feel like, you know, looking at the XML, if it doesn't make your head hurt too much, the transformation service is kind of a useful tool on the BibFrame website. Uh, the other one, or that, that, sorry, that was the comparison service. The other one is a transformation service, and if you feel like submitting your own MARC records, if you want to get really technical with this and mess around with it, um, you have to convert it to MARC XML first, and there is a tool to do that on the Library of Congress website. So. I don't remember if I put that in my resources, but if not, I'll get the link for that to Krista, and she'll include that on the, the show recording page. Um, so if you convert your, you you know, export a batch of records from your catalog, convert it to MARC XML, and then you can submit that URL and have it converted to BibFrame stuff. So if you have the capability to play around with it and you want to see what it looks like, you can go ahead and do that too. So going along with practical applications, there are actually libraries experimenting with BibFrame. Um, it, like I said, a lot of it's theoretical right now, but I mentioned before that there is the Early Experimenters project going on. Um, a lot of national libraries, obviously, you know, they're the ones that probably have the most resources to do this. But OCLC is also involved, a couple of um, university libraries, they're playing around with it. I don't think any of them have necessarily products that can be seen, but they're working with it, they're on it. <laughs> so, um, Another project that I wanted to mention, um, Colorado College and University of Denver, completely separately from the Early Experimenters Project, which is kind of a, an initiative spearheaded by the Library of Congress who's actually developing BibFrame, but Colorado College and the University of Denver decided that they want to go ahead and kind of try to work things out on their own. Um, they're part of a consortium and they wanted to kind of see how BibFrame encoding works with their consortium for as far as sharing records go and things like that. Mm -hmm. So again, Code for Lib Journal, and this one is more technical than the other one that I linked to. It kind of makes my head hurt a little bit, but, <laughs> but I, from what I understand, it's really interesting. Um, 
a quote from this article says, we are currently in the early stages, this is written by the Colorado College folks, they say, we are currently in the early stages of prototyping a peer-to-peer -peer bid frame data store with the University of Denver's Penrose Library. Um, and they say once they reach what they call a critical mass of information in this, they're going to replace their current Mark ILS with this bid frame wow. stuff. So, so even though they're still experimenting, that they're planning on yeah. Right now, there's really nothing that I can point yeah. to and say, "Here, go look at this." But uh, those are ones to keep an eye on if you do want to see kind of an early adopter. I don't know what they consider to be a critical mass. I don't know if they're going to wait for <laughs> any kind of go ahead from the Library of Congress before they unveil it. But they feel that they've got a good enough handle on frame to go ahead and start playing around with it so that's something to keep an eye on so with that said what is next what are we looking at here um, people I know are often asking is there a timeline for this when are we going to see this and do we have to know yeah exactly <laughs> yeah same thing with RDA you know, people were wanting to know okay when is this going to happen and the short answer to the question, is there a timeline, is no. <laughs> um, I think they're really, you know, avoiding tying themselves down to anything. Like I said, it's highly theoretical right now. Um, on the BibFrame website, you know, I looked and looked to see, are they even trying to make any predictions? And they, this is the quote I found. The Mark Standard is responsible for the creation of millions of bibliographic records, and they recognize the need to continue supporting Mark, and most likely for years to come, so... There's not going to be any, you know, yeah, you're not going to have to for a long time, probably. So, and it seems like libraries are going to be kind of determining their own timetable for making the change. Right now, I think we're kind of, you know, it's obviously going to depend on what software is out there, when our library vendor is going to start um, dealing with this. So, I think we're going to kind of be in a holding pattern for a while here still. Um, something that people are probably wondering about is how is this going to affect catalogers on a daily basis? Um, is this going to totally take catalogers out of business? Um, I don't think so. I certainly hope not. Um, but I think that our jobs will change, that is for sure. Um, I mentioned this issue of Information Standards Quarterly before. I highly recommend it. Um, it's in my links. Um, there's four or five different articles that are all really relevant to BibFrame and metadata happenings. Um, the, this is from an interview with a person from the French National Library, uh, and they have been doing a lot. Honestly, I think other countries have been doing a lot more with BibFrame and, you know, linked data than America has, to be honest. Um, but his quote was, I believe we will need, certainly need to change most of our cataloging habits, standards, and tools, but that losing the quality and granularity of the data itself should not be a requirement. I mean, we may have kind of gotten stuck in the past as far as the actual encoding standard goes with MARC, but really librarians are on the ball when it comes to recognizing things like controlled vocabulary and high quality data that's accurate. And, you know, I think we have a lot to offer the whole web community, you know, they're, they're kind of figuring things out, you know, when I'm getting into LinkedIn, they're going, oh, hey, we need controlled vocabularies, we need to, you know, refer to the same thing as in the same way all the time, and librarians are like, duh, we knew that, but, um, so, our skill set, I think, is still very, very, very relevant, um, you know, yes, our tools will change, and our jobs may become more about, oh, evaluating metadata rather than creating it, you know, bringing in things and saying, hey, this matches what we already have, or saying, oh, you know, I think authority work will still be very important. Um, uh, the idea with linked data is that, you know, each person or each subject heading will be represented by a URI, a concept out there on the web. But, you know, we also have to recognize when there isn't a URI for something, and we'll probably be, you know, doing things like creating URIs instead of creating authority records, but it's still the same basic concept, and I think we have a lot to offer. Oh, in fact, I think one of those use cases on the um, the BibFrame website was, you know, creating a URI for an authority. So, you know, yeah, we're still going to be using our same skills. Um, you know, I'm jumping back to that RDF example about the Bob Dylan CD. Somebody had to decide that artist is the term that's going to be used, that country is the term that's going to be used. And these are controlled vocabulary. These are what we do with subject headings. You know, this is. Librarians are still relevant. Catalogers are still going to be relevant, that's for sure. So that was my basic take on BibFrame. Like I said, the very basics of it. Um, for those of you who have attended my presentations before, you know that I really like to throw a lot of resources at you. <laughs> um, you can only they cover... Have stuff to follow. Exactly. Up, you can only cover so much in an hour, and I like to 
you know, do the work for you as far as finding the things that I find really informative out there. There's a lot out there, especially with stuff on the internet these days. Um, most of my resources are web resources that are freely available. Um, as I said, I think I mentioned before, the Library of Congress has what they call their informational site about BibFrame that is separate from the BibFrame.org site. Um, the Bibliographic Framework as a Web of Data is a PDF report that is also referred to as the BibFrame Primer, so that is a very, very good place to start out with. Um, then I've definitely already been talking about the BibFrame.org website a lot. Um, if you really want to be immersed in BibFrame, there is a listserv. You can browse the archives at that website that I've included. Um, from that page, it will also tell you how to subscribe to that list if you want to. I subscribe to it, and to be honest, you know, a lot of it, it's over my head, and I just kind of <laughs> skim it and go, okay, I'll maybe read that thread later when I have time. So you may want to subscribe. You may want to just look at the archives and see if there's topics that are relevant to you. But the listserv is a good place to kind of figure out what's going on. You know, there aren't any announcements that there's developments or new discussion papers, things like that. So that's a good reason to be on the list. Um, I've already mentioned this one several times, but that most recent issue of Information Standards Quarterly is available as a PDF online, and there are four or five different articles in there that are really useful. That interview with the guy from the French National Library I thought was really cool. Um, and then I mentioned before that in the Library with the Lead Pipe article, I already threw that URL at you. Um, that's a good overview of BibFrame and how it relates to kind of the cataloging tradition. Um, an article in library journal that came out fairly recently um, was called linked data in the creases and it's really that was kind of a different take on linked data um, you know I the author sort of expressed her opinion that I think why people are having a hard time getting excited about linked data is that for um, just seeing it in kind of thinking as it as of it as an alternative to mark you know really doesn't highlight its really cool aspects because you're, if you're just dealing with the resources that your library has you're not seeing the whole linking capability of it, but like archival collections and special collection stuff where you can bring together resources from different institutions and things like that. She really highlights, it got me kind of fired up about linked data and where we're going with that. Um, OCLC, of course, it has their fingers in this. They really want to be on the pulse of what's happening with bibliographic data, so they have a working paper on what they've been doing with BibFrame and, you know, linked data and the WorldCat data. And like I said, I mostly link to things that are freely available on the web, but I did want to include a print resource that is available through Cataloging and Classification Quarterly because it is written by one of our very own Nebraskans, um, Angela Krager from UNO. She recently published a, an article about the road to BibFrame, and so that link that I've given you will be the landing page for the journal, but if you don't actually subscribe to it, you won't be able to read it from there. But it's Cataloging and Classification Quarterly, so keep an eye out for that. Angela did a really good job of outlining the kind of the developments that led to BibFrame, the thinking behind why it's important. Um, that article is where I found out about the University of Denver and the Colorado College project, so Angela is clearly on top of the latest developments. And so that's basically it. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, I didn't see anything come in during the show, but if you have any questions, use your um, questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Let me open it up here. Um, no, if you have any questions, comments, <laughs> any of your own thoughts, are you avoiding this completely? Yes. <laughs> you don't have to know yet. I know it was a lot to take in. Maybe everybody's just too stunned to ask questions, but <laughs> I feel like I was talking a mile a minute the whole time, but it, it's, it's a lot to cover. It's a lot of information out there. Well, it's something new, once again, coming out that we got to pay attention to because it's going to is going to be there. Right. And obviously, at the same time as Mark is still being used and everything, so that's good. Yeah. There's a transition. Exactly. There's no yeah, mandate that you have to do this now. Mm -hmm. Like I said, a lot will depend on the vendors. It was the same thing with RDA. Right. Yeah. We have to wait for them to really um, add all this to their systems. Otherwise, yeah. you know, we can want to use it all we want, but if it's not available in what the systems and vendors that we're working with, mm -hmm. yeah, that's so why they're exploring it too, I assume. Yeah, I assume uh, so, yeah. Uh, obviously, OCLC is. You know, right. They're probably going to incorporate it into the whole world share, whatever their mm -hmm. thing is called now. Um, yeah. But I think the Colorado thing is interesting because, you know, maybe yeah. libraries are going to move away from, you know, kind of more homegrown stuff. I don't know. There but, are a lot of libraries doing that with various things like ebooks and yeah. collections like that, saying we can, we, we do have the 
uh, skill and the technology to do some of this ourselves. So right. some of you obviously yeah. the larger ones, obviously right. smaller libraries are going to be more dependent. But if on they vendors. can experiment with it and figure it out for us, right, that's good. Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> All for that. Absolutely. Um, let's see. We do just have a comment. Yeah. Um, Still pretty new for me, I admit, but thanks so much for breaking down the key elements so that I can share with my colleagues and start figuring this out here in, and she is in Colorado. Awesome. So cool. comparing, yeah. yeah, it is, like we said, and I remember when we first started doing sessions on RDA, it was like this. It's the same year. thing, yeah. You it's don't need coming, to know about it yet. We don't but know. Here's the basics. Just at least start thinking about it. Things will change it. probably, but just have this on your horizon, you know. Right. Yeah. All right. doesn't look like any urgent questions have come in, and so that's fine. Um, the session has been is, is being recorded. Uh, the slides will be posted when the recording is up, that you'll all be notified when that is. And all the links, I caught most of them while we were doing the show, but I'll go, go back and make sure I grab all of them. Um, all the links will be made available to you as well um, at, uh, when I send you out the recording information, so you'll have that um, with you. So other than that, since we don't have any urgent questions it looks like coming in, <laughs> I think we will wrap it up for today. Did so, you want to go to the um, Encompass Live page yeah. really quick? Yeah, okay. So, thank you, Emily, Yeah. No problem. Um, for uh, getting us up to speed as far as we can be <laughs> on Big Frame so far. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, I hope it was useful to you. Um, I know I have, um, like I said, I am not a cataloger, so a lot of it, um, I get it. I do. I have to know just what's yeah. going on to be able to work in the library. Lots of thank yous and, and they actually enjoyed this presentation. Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so that will wrap it up for this morning. The show has been recorded. You'll get that information um, later this afternoon. <laughs> we get up. Um, so that will wrap it up for today's show. I hope you join us next week when we have a, um, a Nebraska-centric um, episode, Internships, Cultivating Nebraska's Future Librarians, um, where we're going to hear from here at, uh, in, at the Nebraska Library Commission. We have our 21st Century Librarian um, Internship Grant Program that we've been doing for quite a few years. I'm not even sure how long it's been. Um, and every year we give grants to librarians to um, go to conferences, get their degrees and whatnot, um, help them do things. And we're going to hear from some of the people who got the grants um, this past year, 2013, and how to apply for the next year's grants. So if you're a Nebraska librarian, definitely check into this to see if you can um, see how it's been used and how you can use it. Um, and even if you're not a Nebraska librarian, see what we're doing here and maybe get some thoughts um, for your library. So I hope you sign up for that next week. Also, Encompass Live is on Facebook. So if you are a big Facebook user, you can pop over there and like us on Facebook, and you'll get notifications. Mainly it's just announcements of um, when the show's, what next show is coming up, when a recording is available. Um, this morning I did the recording for last week's show got posted, and then we do a reminder message for the current, um, to today's show. Um, so they'll just keep you up to date um, that way. Um, so if you are big on Facebook and you want to be notified through there, go ahead and like the Encompass Live page there. Other than that, that will wrap it us for the, up us for this morning. Us up. Um, we're a little after eleven, pretty much perfect time. We started a little after ten, so uh, thank you very much. Um, and that was our first show of two thousand fourteen. Yeah. The first show. Uh, we've been doing this for five years now. Of, this is the the first show of the sixth year. That we started in January two thousand and nine. We did a nice um, round year to start right at the beginning. So welcome to two thousand fourteen Encompass Live, <laughs> and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks. <laughs>